Okay, let's get right into this. Is the Kebra Nagast, more correctly, the Kebra Negest, the Kebra Negest, in the language, linguistic Kebra Negest, but in the translations, people are familiar with saying people who don't speak or is not studying the language, you know, as Kebra Nagas, the Kebra Nagas, translated as the glory of kings. Ethiopically speaking, the Kebra, the Kebra, Kebra Negest, Negest. Is it authentic? First of all, I'd like to thank um, the Honorable Priest Isaac, you know, for being on the Rastafari Round Table. He had a lot of brothers like Ras um, Icoma and also Ras Icern as well. We have had a few um, round tables, maybe a couple of them actually, so far to date. You know, but I do give thanks to the Honorable Priest Isaac and also heal up to the Priest Isaac Institute. You know, I ask all of those who check out here to check out over there and also support the works, the homeschooling, the education is the key. So we give thanks to, for the Rastafari round table. But on this question, this is the question that came up and some of our round table has been, you know, in segments uploaded and there was one particular segment where this was, I would say, briefly discussed. Our brother, Ross Icern, gave his um, kind of philosophy, his scholarly philosophy on certain things concerning this heritage, but we really didn't get into it. And therefore, some of our statements, one had mentioned about convoluted. Now, if you don't understand it, I guess it is convoluted. But the first thing is linguistics matter. Linguistics matter. And yes, we did point out the European bias. That has to be acknowledged. One could say that everybody got their own bias. One could say that we have our bias, right? But we know that the European bias has misrepresented a lot of people's history, culture, you know, reality as far as it goes into, you know, scholastic or just in the modern times. We, we know about this, that there's academic racism. And a lot of it has not really been challenged. So we have to be very careful, you know, as we, you know, use some say common sense or use logic. And one can only use logic, like we're bringing out logic of the linguistics. And that's hard for ones who don't understand the linguistics to really understand. You know, but let's go slow right here. Let's take this particular subject matter. Is the Kebra Nagas, the Kebra Nagas, the Kebra Nagas, is it authentic? That was the question. That was the main theme of that particular gathering, Rastafari, Rasta Round Table, that ones have caught various different clips going into different, you know, parts of it and some of the themes there. There's a couple other parts that we'd like to address but hopefully we'll address it in their own vlog follow-up. This is like a vlog follow-up because our brother Icern, he made a lot of good points, right? Some of them were very valid, but other things we tried to um, address them, but there were many of them, you know? So he basically had the floor, as it were. We could call it the Ross Icern, you know, lecture, you know, his uh, philosophical scholarship. Right. Some things that he made the best sense or the best logic. And, you know, he did make certain points, but we did catch him concerning the Falashas and the Beta Israel. He said that it was in that book, Alliance and Alienation. And then when we asked him for the page that it was in, he had to acknowledge that it was something that he heard. But if you rewind the video, you will find that he he points out to the audience that it's in this book. Now, that's the same book that we have and we have studied and read, you know, and highlighted certain important sections. And we did not come across that statement. So many who caught that part would believe, based on some of the other statements that have some verity or truth to it, that he was speaking the truth about what alliance and alienation had in it. And we manifestly found out that he basically said it was something he heard say. Right. So that showed me right there. That showed me a lot right there that we need to take point by point, you know, because if one just gets gallops, you know, they can just gallop all over the place. But if we go point by point, not deal with straw man arguments, you know, but deal with what the question is. So the question here is whether the Kebra, right, the Kebra Nagas 
Ethiopically known as the Kibra Negest, called the Glory of Kings, is it authentic? So here we're going to go to something that we go to a lot and people talk about semantics. Oh, you're playing games with words. Words matter, right? Words matter. And those who make these anti-semantic arguments, they can basically philosophize or, you know, just, just say it means whatever. And they can make a good argument with the ignoramus. Both those of us who have gotten into the scholarship, both from the translations and, and European and, and, and Anglo-American scholarship, some of it is very good and some of it needs um, improvement and needs to be called out. But the cover and the guess is authentic. Let's just say that right there for the record. Here we're at, what, five minutes into this, going six minutes. The cover and the guess Right, what's called the Kibre Neges, right? Right, the Kibre ne, you know, Neges is authentic. Now, how do we come to this conclusion? Well, we come to this conclusion by first of all defining the terms. Let's define terms because when we say authentic, what do you think authentic mean? What do you think authentic mean? We ask two or three people, what does authentic mean? You know, and we'll find maybe two or three or even more different answers. So, if it's a scholarship, then we have to go to, well, what does the word mean in actuality? Not the connotation. Most ones will look up, just do a quick Google and just look up definition, right? In a dictionary. They don't see anything wrong with that. Definition in a dictionary. Isn't a dictionary about diction? What about the definition? This is why etymology, the root words, what does the words mean? And as we study etymology, we can see how terminologies that had original meaning, say, hundreds of years ago, or even 50, even 40 years, words sometimes do change in their popular meaning. So most dictionaries give you a popularist, basically tells you, well, this is how people are using the word today. This is what people think. You know, many times a dictionary reflects the public ignorance. The etymology is where real scholars go to, to find out, well, if I use this particular word, right, in what context am I using this word with scholars? Not people who are going to look things up just in a dictionary, but people who are going to go to the etymology. It's like not people are going to look at the cover and against just in the translation, right, but those who are going to go to right, the original, right, and to those who are able to, you know, open the book, so to speak. You know, and is this area correct? Because this doesn't seem correct right here in the translation. Well, let's go to the original. What does it say in the original? Do what the scholars, the so-called European and the Anglo-American scholars did themselves, right? Not just to depend on, you know, the Finkelsteins, right? Yes, we pointed to the Shlomo Sands, you know, as well, because that pointed to the European Ashkenazi Jews, right, origin in this thing called Judaism based on their best scholarship was 740 AD, 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 right? That means that they were not the ones from BC, period. They were not the ones before 70, 7, 7, 740 AD, right? But the Kebra Neges is authentic. Let's go right here, here, here. And let's first of all define the word authentic. Let's see if we still have this window open here. Yes, we do. With etym online, etym online, etymology online. Here we have authentic is an adjective. Authentic, all right? Is it authentic what? See, an adjective is not a noun. An adjective defines, you know, helps to give a little bit of um, color to a noun. You know, a noun, a person, place, or thing, right? So the fuller question would be, is the Kebra Nagas, is it an authentic, what, document? Is it authentic record? Is it authentic book? Is it authentic history? Is it authentic what? We need a noun. But let's just go into the definition, or rather, the true definition, which would be the etymology of the word authentic. Now, authentic here is mid 14th century. You can see it on the screen right there. Or 
tent. It says authentic, authentic. Notice that back in the 14th century, there was not this TH. We say authentic, but here we have authentic. It says authoritative, duly authorized. Now notice in the open bracket, open um, parenthesis, it says a sense now obsolete closed parenthesis. You see that a sense, right? When we say make sense out of this, they said that a sense, this is the original sense, going back to the earliest recorded, the thing about etym online and etymology, when they say like mid 14th century, that means that if challenged, there are documentation going back to the mid 14th century, which was roughly the 1300s AD, where this term was first being used, especially like in the English, right? The English or other European languages. So here we have authentic, it means authoritative. It means duly authorized. Now, they say it's a sense now obsolete, but in the original sense of the word, the kibra nages, the kibra nagas, as people say, is authentic. Let's go on. It's from the old French. So what we get in the English in the mid 14th um, century, 1300, like, CE 1300s in the from 1300 to like 1399 but the mid 14th century would be roughly around 1350 give or take now this came from the old french authentique so we see authentique you know authentique right is the french right so you see the q u e that's the french style of writing you know and then we have authentic with T-I-K. So you see the T-I-K and you see the T-I-Q-U-E. What does that say since authentic, authentic comes from authentique, the French? It says authentic. Now, of course, we know that, you know, when you ask, well, what does good mean? What does good mean? And you say good means good. That really doesn't help right there, you know? And that really doesn't help right there. What good means? Well, good means something that is 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 well, you know, like well being is is you have to use another terminology, something that's beneficial in that kind of sense, right? But here on authentique, thirteenth century, so we see that the word was French, right? Was was French, and then the English speakers adopted it, right? As as a European and the knowledge on the European continent kind of goes from east to west, right? It goes from Eastern Europe, and then it goes westward, right? And then we get it in the English, in England, you know? And then it comes down to us, you know, over here through the Protestant or the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Some people get offended when we say European or Protestant. Why is that? It's just pointing out, we didn't say these are racist or not racist. We're just saying that the other culture that has gone into our culture and trying to feed back to us our culture with all their doughty poutiness, we are now checking them, right? And where possible and where we need to correcting them. 13th century modern French, authentique. So basically we see that there. So, so about a hundred years later, this word goes into English usage and directly from now here, we're getting more to the root directly from medieval Latin authenticus, authenticus, authenticus. And it's from the Greek authentikos, authentikos. And what does authentikos mean? It means original. So the root of authentic even beyond authoritative and duly authorized and canonical. Notice what they say, canonical. I don't know if we read that when we went through this um, just now. We said authentic and then we went on to the modern French 13th century. But we highlight that right there, canonical. All right? So now this is like tracing it. It's like tracing it to the root. Getting to the root, the root right here is the Greek. All right? The Greek, right? Authentikos. Authentikos, the Greek. And what's the meaning? Original, genuine, principle, right? From 
authentes, authentes, authentes. What does authentes mean? One acting on one's own authority. Pause. Boom. Here we go right here. Here we go right here. All right? So the root of authentic is one acting on one's own authority. Remember, we're talking about the, the Kibra Nagas, right? Or the Kibra Nagast. The Kibra Nagas, I'm going to say it more the Ethiopian way so we can get into the more correct pronunciation. The Kibra Nagas, right? The Kibra Nagas, right? Is this document, this book, right? Is it authentic? Is it based on what the root mean? One acting on one's own authority, or did somebody else come along, right, and make you know we could say the Ethiopians, especially tracing it to the the most recent, you know we could say um, recension of this ancient document, around twelve, around this is around thirteen. Get the it's around thirteen hundred, the same time. We have 1360 Yakuno Amlak and the restoration of the Solomonic dynasty, where we get the um, Nabura Id uh, Yitzhak, right? He is the translator, and then he also, some additional materials were added during that time in Ethiopian history, the restoration of the Solomonic dynasty. That was roughly 1260 AD. Now, notice the word authentic and the Kivrneges in the form that we have it translated, you know, coming down to say the Queen of Sheba, only son Minulik, the Wallace Budge version, which we would say is one of the more um, accurate translations in light of the original, right, document that was so translated. Let's bring this up right here for one to see. All right. Okay, here we go. Let's bring this up right here. Okay, boom. This document right here. Now, this is also a reprint, a republish. Kubrenegest. Or in the more ancient, Kubrenegest. 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 That's the more ancient. Now, a lot of folks will say, Negesht. That's not the way it is. Okay, well, the real Ethiopian scholars of the Gutters, please stand up. You know, Kibrenegas, but we call it the Kibrenegas, you know, the, you know, the Kibrenegas, glory of the kings. This document right here, as let's pull this up so ones can see more of this being a facsimile, like a copy in that sense, of the original or what other word can we use now that we know the etymology, authentic Ethiopic text, the Gutters, right? The, you know, the Gutters, right? And manuscript of the Queen of Sheba and her only son, Minulik, translated into English by Sir E. A. Wallace Budge. Now, he had received for such work from Emperor Minulik. You know, from Emperor Minulik or Dagmawi Minulik, I'd say Dagmawi Minulik, he received the Star of Ethiopia third class for his particular work. All right, so just to point that out. So in other words, his translation of this work was received by Imperial Ethiopian authorities such as Minulik, Emperor Minulik II. Right, Emperor Minulik II, when when a a scroll of the translation and probably some other documents were sent, was sent back to the um, King of Kings of Ethiopia at that time. Speaking about Minulik II, Dagmawi Minulik, right? Dagmawi Minulik and the Ethiopian sovereign, right, upon that throne of David, sent back to him for his work a star of Ethiopia, third class. Two others received a star. One was, I think, the Edward. Was it Edward at that time? One of the kings, the king of England at that particular time. And Lady Miu, Miu, or Miyuk. Some would say Miyuk, but I think it's Miu, right? Lady Miu, because she did a very wonderful work too. Well, we need, need to touch on her. Many people don't talk about Lady Miu, Miu, M-E-U-X. In fact, that's a French... Right, that's a French name right there, 
And since I'm putting her name in this right here, I would like to at least get a little better um, pronunciation of this. Since it's, uh, let's see, the French right here. Let's, let's bring this out. French. Wow. It actually means better in French. Mm -hmm. Moo. Moo. You hear that right there? Mm -hmm. That's, that's M-E-U-X. You'll find her mentioned in the forward. And in the forward and introduction pages of the Queen of Sheba and Onison Minulik. Right? So this was special Jubilee printing. I think this is around 2011. This document right here. And this document contains the Ethiopic text. So what we and others have done is sat down with Budge's translation. Chapter by chapter. Reading Budge translation. On the one hand. And then going into the Kibra Nagesh, on the other hand, the glory of kings. And we see that for an English translation, structurally speaking, and in, with general accuracy, it has general accuracy, although there are some reasonments as we get into the Ethiopic that even gives us more, you know, depth to it. But as a basic English translation, we've gone through it chapter by chapter, line by line, we can go through that, right? So those um, resources, right, are not European. Even though Europeans got their hand on it, the original source of it is Ethiopia. So this document here and this document right here, let's go to this document and this document. This is the LOJ reprint right here, right, with, um, that was from, I think, what was that? Was that Jet Magazine? It wasn't Ebony. I think it was Jet Magazine. That was actually in Jet Magazine during the 60s. You know, black people were into the Ethiopian, you know, culture as well as the Hebrew and were making those links for themselves. The next copy that I would recommend, right, if one don't get the LOJ reprint right here, 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 you know, LOJS.org, you know, to order a copy of this. One can always get this one that was printed and published prior to by, I think this was, um, was it Frontline? Frontline Publishers. This is a very good, you know, um, printing of it too, right? We will call this the more official one. Now, we know there's Miguel Brooks, right? Uh, is it Miguel Brooks? Let's see if we have, do we have him here? I think we have him further. Okay, right here, right? Is this... Um, yeah, this is Miguel Brooks. We have a copy of this, but this was actually based on a, I think, a Spanish or Portuguese translation. All right, so this is not even based on the Ethiopic, but it's based on a translation, right, into a European language and then further translate into English, right? So we find... It's a good copy. We like this copy here as a scholarly point of reference. But for accuracy with the Ethiopic, Budges is more accurate. Although here on the cover, they present, you know, the carrying poles on the Ark of the Covenant in a more accurate way right here. I know that's a might seem like a minor point now, but for the scholars, the fellow scholars, you know, they will no doubt understand the significance of that. Right, like it says, right, like it shows right here. This is the back of the book. You can see the Ethiopic, but yet this document, the Miguel Brooks, when he says it's the first and only modern English translation, that is, that is, that is somewhat that's correct there. But even in the book, he basically goes into right exactly, you know, um, where you know it came from, and I think it was a Spanish manuscript that he had gotten a hold of. And then there was a translation made from that particular Spanish version. So it kind of helps us to see how the Kibrnegesh was being disseminated and translated by different, you could say, European scholars and how it was beginning to disseminate in Europe. But this would be have to be considered like a second generation while Budge's is more direct. When we compare the translation he has here, it doesn't line up with the Ethiopic. So that means that the Spanish or the Portuguese version might be where things differed, right? Since he's basically relying on a translation 
to make an English translation while Budge, right, while Budge for his part, right, while Budge for his part was basically, um, you, know, you can find that right there, the Ethiopic text, L-O-J-S, right, Budge was translating from this Ethiopic, right, so which document would, would be in that sense the most authentic, right, well, this, the Kevin and the Guess of Budge, right, because it's basically accurate in this basic chapter numbering and the basic verses into a basic King James-like translation. I have to say that a King James, a basic structurally translation and basic accuracy, not going into the nuances of words, but the basic plain meaning of words, this would be considered, you know, authentic. But the more authentic version, right? The more authentic version of this would be here, right here. Let's bring this up once again, would be this. This would be the most authentic. But of course, this is still in the good as language. So that means that most ones would have to rely on a good translation of this. And we are stating right here on the record that Budge's version, right, is a good translation right, of this authentic document. Once again, let's return to authentic here. Just going to seek to focus on this particular point right here, authentic. Once again, authentic, the root right here, let's highlight this whole section right here so one can see what we are pointing to right here, right? The highlight portion from the Greek, authentikos. What does it mean? Original, genuine, principle from the root authentes authentes and what does it mean right here we have this right here it means to act right here we go to act one acting on one's own authority one's acting so here's the question is the does the kibra negas the kibra negas represent one acting on one's own authority that's just a question right there. Or did somebody else impose this? Was this imposed on, say, the Ethiopian circa 13th century, 13th century circa 1260? And we're pointing to the, the time that the latest recension is an earlier Tigre. There's an earlier document, right? There's an earlier document that is the core, right? Ancient document. Right, that what we have in the present form, right, was was built up upon, right, during the restoration, right, of the Solomonic dynasty. But the core elements are there. That's why I was trying to bring across in the Rasta Round Table, and then I recognize, well, ones are not really familiar with that level of scholarship. So it might have sounded like I was just talking, talking, talking stuff because ones are only limited to these translations. Right? And therefore, to come up with their own philosophies, instead of being able to fact check it as one who is dealing with the language. This is why His Majesty says, Katamawi Hala Selassie says that language is the key right, of communication between man and man. So if we here in the diaspora who, you know, have in a sense lost right, our culture and have gone through this 400 plus years want to reclaim it we have to do that work that ancient egypt called the opening of the mouth not just speak and talk to, no the language the linguistic right then we can truly our scholarship can be as authentic as possible one's acting on one's own authority right so if we critique something in a budge version we can go to the authentic, the original Ethiopic version. Others just have to accept what it is as it is, right? Or wait until a European or a, a Anglo-American, you know, scholar does that work. Because we, we, we commented how European scholars would go into, you know, the linguistics, learning language, learning gutters, and all of this, and we challenge the Rastafari, especially if we're talking about Hala Selassie, if we're talking about the King of Kings, we're talking about this ancient Judeo-Christian culture. And that, that offends a lot of ones today because there's a lot of fight against the European Gentile, you know, um, and those who call themselves Jews, a lot of 
the overreach and lies and other distortions that have been out there, you know, within the name of the Bible and Christianity, right? And then he turned to the roster, for many of the rosters, and many of them not up to, you know, even with the ISU became the Israelites, many of them were not up to, they didn't even know the Bible, and some of them will burn the Bible. I know some of y'all burn the Bible, but then you talk about Selassie and that he's God and this and that, but you don't, you don't see your own hypocrisy, your own foolishness, and you're only burning the Bible because you cannot act from your own authority in the Bible. You have to rely on something that you don't really understand. Now, the root of authentes, I know this is not going to, you know, ones will be upset because the truth is an offense, right? The truth is an offense, but it's not a sin. So we're doing, right, what his imperial majesty and in the time of his majesty, they did and what he encourages. Not to rely on Europeans who have a better insight than most of these ones. And I have to say this, you know, than most of these ones who are just quoting, referring to some books that you know, European scholars commenting on the European Jews. And then people turn around and then say, well, if the European Jewish thing has been proven to be somewhat mythological or in a way fraudulent in some way based on their own investigation, that does not dismiss the Ethiopian testimony. And when ones try to say, well, Solomon and Sheba is only mythology, then they are basically putting the words of the King of Kings, our Godfather, our King of Kings in disrepute. Do you think that his majesty believes that the Solomon and the Queen of Sheba story is just like a myth, like somebody just made it up? It, there's no fact to it. But this is where some of the Rastafari are borderline. You know, you're on a borderline level right there. And what it is, the pride. You know, it's a pride right there. If we would just now get to the basics, authentic. Self, auto, hentes. Doer, being. You see that what it says right there? Let's let, let's scroll this over just to get to this root word because sometimes when we have discussion and somebody asks, well, whether it's this or that, and we have a word, we don't really define terms. It's like even in real debates, some parameters must be defined. What does it mean? Based on the etymology of authentic, right? It means self doer. Autos is self. And hentes is doer or being, self-being, self-doing, right? So the Ethiopians, right, of that highland and Israelite-related civilization around 1260 AD, they were doing this, right, even in that re-dissemination and issuing of the Kepernigas in the present form that we have it in the Queen of Sheba and my son Menelik, they were doing this themselves. So is it authentic? Yes, it is authentic, right? To accomplish, to achieve the sense of real entitled to acceptance as factual is recorded from the mid 14th century, right? And brother Isern, you are correct when you say that I, unlike my brother, you know, scholar, um, is a maximalist. We are maximalists, while our brother scholar Ross Eisern is a minimalist. Right? I would say in some senses it seems dismissive, right? But a minimalist. But these are accurate terms, I thank you, Icoma, you know, for introducing those those um academic terms, right? A maximalist. Like some would try to minimize the Kevernegas, its significance. Right, we seek to maximize. We are maximalists. We seek to maximize, right, its authenticity, and in other words, to defend its authenticity, right? Not to chuck it off in some pseudo mythological, you know, category as though it has no real history because you want to be a grave robber and dig up somebody's grave. You see, that's following in the European mindset right there. And notice, maybe in Egypt today, they have to do those things, but you really want them to do this. The, the, the Ethiopians of the highland who defend this Judeo-Christian root, right? This Solomon and Sheba, you could say history and narrative and root. Do they have to go and dig up bones and then have the, somebody else qualify 
in order for we to accept the testimony of our ancestors? This is crazy. And, and the testimony of the Bible as well, the scripture. So the sense of real entitled to acceptance as factual. This is also from the mid 14th century. So we both went to the root idea, right? One acting on one's, right? One's acting on one's own authority or self doing, self being, right? With the later meaning that comes into vogue, authoritative, duly authorized, or the sense of real, being real, entitled to acceptance as factual, right? Now, some Rastas, you know, who may want to be dismissive, claim Rastafari, but yet be dismissive, and claim Hala Selassie I, but yet be dismissive of that, it is basically to contradict and contravene, right, his majesty's testimony and also the testimony of other, you could say, Ethiopian sovereigns and monarchs upon that Solomonic, Davidic, you know, Judeo-Christian, you know, we say enterprise in the highlands of Ethiopia. Let's just bring this up into the mix right here since we are still are on this particular point, the cover and the guess. Is it authentic? Ras Iodonis says, Yadin says, Yadin says yes, but what is authentic? Let's get to the root idea. So when we use this particular, here's what I mean by this. Now you see we're here at this page. Let's just do this right here just to compare and contrast. Authentic. Let's take our etymology and let's go to definition, right? Let's go to definition, right? Definition, right? The definition. And we're just going to pull up the first definition just to give you a idea of what. authentic all right they said of undisputed origin we could go with that genuine now see you notice how they put genuine there of undisputed origin and then you see right there they say genuine then they give you an example they say the letter is now accepted as an authentic document all right then they have some of the synonyms all right authentic now in music look at this right here it's interesting. In music, right? And music is of a church mode comprising the notes lying between the principal note or final note and the note an octave higher. So authentic is also a musical term. See, this is important. When we use this word, in what context are we using the word, right? Of undisputed origin, this is the definition. Right, genuine. This is the definition. Here they say, "What's the true meaning of authentic?" And this is what ones will go to. They'll they'll just go Merriam-Webster dictionary, and they say, "Well, authentic is genuine, bona fide." Right now, what does bona fide mean? You know what bona fide means? Bona fide means good faith, bona fide. Fide is faith. Uh oh. Wait, wait. Hold on for a moment. Now, people say, we're not talking about religion or belief. No, we're not talking about religion or belief. We're talking about bona fide. If I say someone is bona fide, I say this one has good faith or good credit. I will put good credit in this person or this thing or whatever I'm saying is bona fide. But the word bona fide or bona fide means good faith and faith in the sense of good credit. It has a good credit, right? And the kibrnegest, of the Ethiopians, we can go back into into historical when it came in amongst the European, right? And it was testified by and large as being bona fide. Now they say bona fide means being actually and exactly what it claimed. Now you could go with that, but that's that, that's a kind of like remember we already we went to the etymology. You, you see what the root is. Now, you can see how this is like a, a connotation. This is what you call most definitions are connotations, right? Are connotation. Like we say, yo, that was really bad. Yo, that, that music is bad, man. That's bad. Now, somebody, if, they, if I wrote it down on a piece of paper, that music is bad. Somebody who gets to learn English will say bad. That means it was no good. But we know how bad 
nowadays can be used as good. You see what I'm saying? And this is what's happened for a lot of words. That's why it's called Babylon, right? Confusion, right? That's why the Bible even says, study to show yourself approved to highlight him to the almighty, right? That means men and people may not agree, but it's whether the, the almighty, the author of reality agrees. Then that means it's going to be really real, is real. Authentic implies, you see what they say that? Implies, the implication. So what is this? This is this and this. Okay, so what's the implication of that? So they told me what it is. Now they're going to tell you the implication. Implies being fully trustworthy as according with fact an authentic account, uh, for example, this is the example here, an authentic account of the perilous journey. It can also stress painstaking and faithful imitation of the original. Did you pick up on that? Even in the definition, which by and large is the connotation, right? It has some elements of truth to it. They're basically telling you that the, for this question here, is the Kevin the guess authentic? That it is. Have you read the Kevin the guess? Right? I mean, I'm talking about the translation. And let's go right here to this right here. Let's take that off and let's go over here. Let's go. Have you read the Kevin the guess? Right? And we're speaking about this is LOJ, Line of Judah reprint right here with the Queen of Sheba from, I think this was uh, Jet or Ebony, Ebony Magazine. I really think it was Jet Magazine. Right? But it may have been Ebony Magazine. Right? This particular cover right here is a beautiful art. You know what I mean? That means it's back in the 60s. It's the old 60s art right here. And then we have this Kevin Guess, right? For the disciples, you know, check this out right here, the Kevin Guess, right? We see that the Nabura Id, which is the Ethiopic term, the keep of Aksum, Wagshum, at that time, that he basically states, you know, how it was painstaking to bring this into, you know, um, the Ethiopic, you know, again, for this restoration, this restoration of the Solomonic dynasty, right? That means the Solomonic dynasty was already, but if you know the history of the pre-1200s, you know, pre-1260, you would know about, you know, the Mohammedans and what was going on in the north and how many of the um, Ethiopians who made Judeo-Christian and and Israelite related claims had to reposition themselves further south from the Tigra, Aksum, the Northern Highlands because of the Mohammedan, Ottoman, Turkish onslaught because of what was going on there. You know, like what it says in, was it Psalm um, what, 83? There was ones who were seeking to wipe out the name of Israel, right? And ones and ones, you know that Psalm right there. And I've heard some goofy Israelites that would try to put, say, Ethiopia is somehow um, referred to in there. Ethiopia is only referred to because of the Israelites, because they sought to wipe out, you know, the name of the Israelites, right, in that highland civilization, what we call the Israelites of Ethiopia. And we can bring proof from former kings of Ethiopia upon that Judeo-Christian Solomonic Davidic dynasty that said on the record, right, that they are descendants, their forefathers are the Israelites. Further affirming, and this is, this is further affirming the ancient, you know, testimony and even the biblical, the evidence that we have in the Bible. So we have to connect the dots from the Bible Right to outside of the Bible, where other testimonies of the people were being made in continuous, right, in continuous periods of time. So it's already known that there were Israelites, right, that repositioned themselves in what we call today Ethiopia and those regions. So in Psalm, yeah, Psalm 83, right, where it speaks about how there are those who would take crafty. Um, counsel against thy people, thy people, right, who technically, ones who say were Israelites, right, or well, I say technically Ethiopian, but actually Israelites, they trace their heritage, and this is not all Ethiopia, that brings us like the second, 
thing we want to follow up on are Ethiopians, Israelites, all right, Jews, question mark. Some are, some aren't. And we're speaking about this Davidic, Solomonic lineage that Kanamawi Hala Selassie, Negusa Negese, Ethiopia, Moan Besazem Negede Yehuda, the line of the tribe of Judah, Hala Selassie I, king of kings of Ethiopia, that his claim is to that aspect of our Ethiopian heritage, right? That claim right there. So these Rastas, some of them that try to dismiss the authenticity of it, do you see where it will now contradict and, and conflict with his majesty's testimony and other Ethiopian sovereigns, right? Going back, right, more than 2,000 years. Bob Marley had said this, Berhana Selassie, you cannot, 3,000 years of history, you cannot wipe away so easily, right? Some are getting caught up, right, in a lot of this, quote, scholarship going on, right, you know, and they're not really going deep enough in the scholarship to truly be called scholars, because if we cannot go into the linguistics, if only the European can go into the language and translate, and only we are going to quote his translation and never fact check it for ourselves, <sighs> you know, with the Bible, we might not have had a choice at one time. Even now, we don't have to just accept, you know, his translations. And many of you all know, we point out that King James Version is a good structural translation. It's accurate in many areas, but some areas it's not fully accurate, even with it being translated from the Hebrew, as it says, of the Old Testament and the Koine Greek of the New. So when it says right here that they have said, my come, let us, let, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. Not only did this happen in past times, right? We could say more in the biblical times, but it also happened wherever there were people that made that positive claim, right, to Israel, Beta Israel, or being related, descended, or connected with the house of Israel, as we have with the Israelites of Ethiopia. And we said the Israelites of Ethiopia, we're not saying that all Ethiopians are Israelites. But when we're speaking of the Solomonic, the Davidic, this Judeo, you know, Christian thing, namely we're talking about that Israelite connection from the time of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. In fact, the factuality of it is even enshrined within both, I think, the first and the second constitutions of Ethiopia by his imperial majesty. It is a part of the whole anointing rite and ritual of the one who we refer to as the black messiah, seeing that he was anointed according to those Israelite rites. So on that particular level, I think this particular point of authenticity right, should be made clear, right? Based on both the etymology that we went to first, right? And to also, right, here we go right here, right? Let me, let me highlight this particular verse right here, where it says that it can also stress painstaking and faithful imitation of the original. So there was an original, and then there was a faithful imitation of the original. This is what we have in the present form of the Kevin and I guess, right, based on the earlier that like the Tigran, the Tigran and the earlier Gutas and Tigran documents, which form the original, we could say, core of what is the the skeleton, you know, the skeleton of the Mar of the present Kevranagas. The present Kevranagas is 1260. Right? There's an older version, undated, right, as to its, you could say, the first copy of it, but it's an older version. We can we can understand that linguistically and contextually, right? And that's all part of the um the Sheba cycle. Let's bring this up right here. Um here we like just like to point out this um you know and in and work for the truth of Ethiopia and verifying Ethiopia's ancient claims and even by extension we black people's claims. Here we have um the late professor 
um, Dr. Bernard Lehman, right? And he wrote a very good work right here. This is him. Um, it is said that he passed away in um, uh, Tigra. Notice this, Tigra, right? The northern part and the document, the older document, the Kevin Negus is a Tigran document, right? That was the core, right, document, right? That also has been faithfully copied right within the present form that we have so we both have the present recension from 1260 that's the kevin Negus. that's the queen of sheba only son Minule. and then there's the older document that i think the only translation was maybe an italian or a french one i think it might have an english one i definitely would like to follow up and share that with you you know, but we know that that document is the core document. And this is a very good work. Also, LOJS, the Lion of Judah Society, LOJS.org. Look this up on that platform. You know, go to the books, Queen of Sheba and Biblical Scholarship. This particular document, Queen of Sheba and Biblical Scholarship. This is probably one of the best treatments on the authenticity right of this and also the various different recensions that came from the original documents and also the faithfulness right to the original of it so this particular document here 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 is what we like to point out as a further evidence we was not able to really bring all of that forward you know um within the roster round table but this was what we were seeking to get at while still addressing you know some of the philosophical scholarship of my brother you know the minimalist seeking to minimize right the historicity of it we are seeking to maximize the historicity of it because even the ethiopians themselves from such a time even we just go back to 1260 a.d to the time of his majesty also verified this as well and took it as being historically verifiable. These were claims that were life or death claims. Now, one could believe that, well, maybe they were just making claims, these claims and everything, and it wasn't true. Yet, that would run into the contradiction of the people themselves. I'm talking about the Ethiopians, not Europeans or other scholars that, you know, are looking at things and, and raising doubts. And why are they raising doubts? All right? This now goes to the, you know, scientific racism and the racism that overtly, in the past it was more overt, today it's more covert. And this particular scholar who, you know, wrote this right here, Dr. Bernard Lehman, he kind of addresses this as well in this particular document. So, the Kavrnegas, is it authentic? What saith ye? We say, yes, it is an authentic document, right? The Kavrnegas. And for comparing with the older or the original documents that have made their way into the translations today, Right, we point to this one right here, Kivar Nagas. This is also available at lojs.org. Right, there might be some PDF forms that are available. If not, we'll seek to make those available, you know, for scholars. You know, once want to get a hard copy, they can order this lojs.org. I think they might also be available some of the books on the Amazon platforms as well. Um, just a couple of um, quotes from the, the Kibra Negas before we seal this up. This right here, the only thing that we love how people, uh, the ones who did this right here, just doesn't tell us exactly where in the document, but this is a part of the document. Then all the saints who were gathered together said, in all truth, the king of Ethiopia is more exalted and more honorable than any other king upon the earth because of the glory and greatness of the heavenly Zion. Now, this is often in reference to the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, and also in reference to the true faith, my Yeshua HaMoshia, Jesus Christos, born of Kedistin Gilmarium, the Black Madonna, who is also likened 
right, and connect it even in the Kevin and the Guess with the Ark of the Covenant. So we have the Ark of the Covenant, and then we have St. Mary, the Black Madonna, and as the tablets of the law, the stone tablets were placed in the Ark, then within Kedis Din Glamarium, that, you know, the seed of the woman prophecy from the beginning of the scripture, do we have Jesus Christos, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMoshiach. So that's one of the context of that here this one we love this one the word of exiavi of the sin of yahuwah cutteth like a straight sharp sword and in like manner the scriptures cut from men's hearts the danger caused by deceitful fables and imaginings. Now notice, the Kevin and the Guest says this, now they're trying to flip it. They're trying to say, oh, the Kevin and the Guest is just fables and just, but the Kevin and the Guest is, you know, the word of Yahuwah, right? And the testimony of his people from the biblical times moving forward even to the end times. And it says that the word of Yahuwah, right? Xavier Malet, cutteth like a straight sharp sword. And in like manner, the scriptures. What's all this shade that a lot of rosters are putting on the Bible? Where, where, where is this coming from? Considering the teaching of his majesty, that's very inconsiderate. The word of Xavier cut off like a straight, sharp sword. And in like manner, the scriptures cut from men's hearts. The dangers caused by deceitful fables and imagings or imaginings. No wonder many ones want to throw shade on the Bible, want to big up the King of Kings, but yet put down the Bible. And now what put down the Kevin and Guess? This one right here. He who heaps up gold and silver does so to no profit without wisdom. But he who heaps up wisdom, no man can snatch it from his heart. One more right here. And Solomon spoke further to the queen queen of the south, known as the queen of Sheba, saying, what is the use of us, B'nai Adam, the children of men or the children of Adam, if we do not exercise kindness and love upon earth? Yes, 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 yes. All right, so let's keep it live and direct right here, the Kevin and the Guess, uh, even, even looking at this right here. This is part of the Kevin and the Guess. Real scholarship will have us say, let's go into this. Where in the Kevin and the Guest is this written? All right, let's study this, all right, to shoe ourselves approved. If we're going to defend, all right, the teaching of His Majesty, first of all, we have to receive the teaching of His Majesty. That's why it says, give us the teaching of His Majesty. Yes, it's authentic. Stop deep ending right on the translated scholarship yes a lot of us use that but we don't only use that some of y'all only use that until one can get up their linguistic weight or at least less fellowship so we can go through this and each one teach one and we can get a better insight right into our own heritage right we can fact check right the scholarship of the present as well as the scholarship Right of the past. Alright, so here, here, here. The Kevernagas, yes, the Kevernagas, based on both the etymology and the connotation, right? The Kevernagas is authentic.